Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Andrew Knox and for Gordon Robertson. The U.S. is airdropping humanitarian aid to Gazans displaced by the war, along with several nations, including Israel. Vice President Kamala Harris is now demanding Hamas agree to a ceasefire, even though the terror group is refusing to give Israel a list of all hostages still alive. CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Several nations, including Israel, are dropping aid to Gaza by ear in an attempt to get help directly to the citizens of Gaza, who the U.N. reports are on the verge of starvation. The IDF says much of the aid going into Gaza by land is stolen by Hamas and tells CBN News the humanitarian crisis serves the propaganda goals of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. Ceasefire talks resumed in Cairo but Hamas refuses to provide information on the well-being of the hostages, a key demand by Israel. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris says it's up to Hamas to agree to the ceasefire. Let's get a ceasefire. Let's reunite the hostages with their families. And let's provide immediate relief to the people of Gaza. Harris criticized Israel for not doing more to increase aid into Gaza, and said humanitarian aid convoys must not be targeted. The IDF denies it targeted Gazans and says it's reviewed last week's tragedy when more than 100 Gazans died in a rush to get aid. Our initial review has confirmed that no strike was carried out by the IDF towards the aid convoy. The majority of Palestinians were killed or injured as a result of the stampede. Retired General Amir Avivi tells CBN News the war is at a critical moment. Because the Hamas retreated to Rafah, all the leadership is there, the hostages are there, and now this is the decisive moment where when the IDF will go into Rafah, this will be the defeat of Hamas. In the meantime, War Cabinet member Benny Gantz traveled to Washington and is expected to meet with Vice President Harris. Prime Minister Netanyahu rebuked Gantz, saying there's only one prime minister, and told Israeli officials in D.C. not to meet or help Gantz. Some see the impromptu visit as an attempt to undermine Netanyahu and pressure him to make more concessions to the U.S. In hopeful news, students have begun to return to the southern community of Stirot five months after the Hamas massacre on October 7th. Look at the joy. If we were looking for a symbol of victory, so look around. This is the symbol of victory of Starot. This is the symbol of victory of the people of Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks so much, Chris. Here at home, tomorrow is Super Tuesday, the biggest day so far on the election calendar. Republicans and Democrats in 15 states will hold primaries to decide their nominees for president. There seems to be little question about the outcomes, and Dale Hurd has the details. As the nation prepares for Super Tuesday, President Biden and former President Trump are leading everywhere the delegates are up for grabs. Donald Trump has a wide lead over Nikki Haley, and Joe Biden has all but two of Democratic delegates so far. CBN News reporter Tara Merginer was at the Trump rally in Richmond, Virginia over the weekend. Ahead of Super Tuesday, Donald Trump is dominating the GOP primary in Virginia. Here in Richmond, supporters started lining up the day before to get a spot inside the rally. Those Trump supporters voiced many of the same concerns. I love his America first stance. I want the borders closed. The economy is. The illegal border crossing. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley did win the District of Columbia's GOP primary on Sunday in her first victory over Donald Trump in the 2024 cycle. This is the time for us to make our choice. This is the time for us to be loud and let everybody know that America is better than what we see right now. Since D.C. is one of the most heavily Democratic jurisdictions in the country with only about 23,000 registered Republicans, the Trump campaign sarcastically congratulated Haley for being elected Queen of the Swamp. She was going around every show, Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump this and that. That wasn't working too well. Trump is likely to pick up several hundred more delegates tomorrow. On NBC's Meet the Press, Haley refused to pledge to endorse him if he's the GOP nominee. So you're no Trump's longer bound by that pledge? 
No, I think I'll make what decision I want to make. More bad news for Joe Biden as he prepares to deliver the State of the Union Thursday. A new AP poll shows six in ten Americans doubt his mental fitness. He trails both Trump and Haley in a New York Times poll, and two-thirds of voters think the country is headed in the wrong direction. First Lady Dr. Jill Biden was stumping for her husband in Las Vegas. We are immovable and unstoppable. Biden's bad polling numbers come after the Michigan primary in which more than 100,000 Democratic primary voters chose uncommitted. What's seen as a protest vote by Arab American voters over his support for the war in Gaza could come back to haunt the president in November. Former President Trump could learn today whether the Supreme Court will allow states to ban him from their ballots. The justices are expected to decide a Colorado case kicking Trump off the ballot over actions related to January 6th. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thank you, Dale. Joining us now for more is CBN Chief Political Analyst David Brody. David, what do you think? Will Nikki Haley drop out after Super Tuesday? And what, what really does she gain if she stays in the race? Well, the answer to the first part of the question, Andrew, and good morning, by the way, uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, she'll drop out after Super Tuesday. At that point, uh, Donald Trump will be way on his way to winning this nomination. He's got about 247 delegates uh, right now. Uh, there's over 800 plus uh, to be decided on Super Tuesday. Donald Trump expected to win most of those. So uh, Donald Trump will be close to 1,000 delegates at that point. You need 1,200, 1,215, technically, uh, to win the nomination. It'll be a game, set, match for Nikki Haley. She'll get out. And she doesn't have much to win at all at this point. Maybe uh, a potential show on MSNBC. Uh, she's kind of morphing into the new Liz Cheney. But other than that, that's about it. Dale's report, uh, we heard Jill Biden say the campaign is immovable and unstoppable. <laughs> But a new poll shows six out of 10 voters doubt Biden's mental capacity. Do you think he will be the nominee? You know, uh, that is a really tough question. I will say I, I personally, from an analysis standpoint, don't see him being the nominee. Now, having said that, let's be honest. Uh, this is all up to Joe Biden. You know, Jill Biden, Jill Biden just said that Joe is unmovable. Uh, that's true. Uh, there's a lot of stubbornness on Joe Biden's part. Uh, there have been Democrats that have gone to him and said, Joe, let's have a discussion. And Joe will not have that discussion. So at what point, Andrew, does it get to where Democrats say, Joe, listen, we are going to lose to Donald Trump. You are going to lose to Donald Trump. I mean, poll after poll shows this. Andrew, let's put this in perspective about the polls, because everybody says, oh, it's one poll, it's two polls. No. Donald Trump didn't beat Joe Biden in any national poll in 2020. Zero. He's beating them consistently in the last four or five, six months in poll after poll after poll. It is not good for Joe Biden. So at some point, you have to wonder whether or not he'll be the nominee. But that will be up to Joe Biden. If his stubbornness and he decides that he he's the only guy that can beat Trump, well, then they may have a rude awakening come November. So you're saying he's already refused, you know, People saying, Joe, now's not the year. You're saying he's already said enough of that already. Well, privately, yes. And then also publicly, look what's been happening. I mean, Democrats have come out. I mean, we hear death by a thousand paper cuts. This is death by a thousand paper headlines. I mean, there's been headline after headline on purpose by Democrats. David Axelrod, just recently former Obama staffers, uh, suggesting that maybe the Democrat Party needs to go in a different direction. Uh, this is a way to kind of get Joe Biden to listen and have it done, uh, you know, kind of a smooth way. Uh, but he's clearly, if he's not getting the message, he doesn't want to receive the message. All right. Well, the Supreme Court agreed to hear Trump's case claiming immunity for actions while in office. So that could push his trial for alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election late into the campaign. So how might seeing a candidate on trial affect the vote in November? Well, that's the Democrats' wild card in all of this. This is what they're hoping for. Uh, and polls have shown that Donald Trump's support would slip if he was convicted, not necessarily in the middle of a trial, but if convicted. Uh, but, Andrew, the timing on all of this is curious. Well, I shouldn't say curious. It's going to be suspect to the point where you wonder if any of these trials will actually come through uh, towards the uh, before November 4th, if they'll be concluded before November 4th. Uh, right now, Donald Trump is on a path for an inside straight. 
I mean, he, he may be able to defeat New York. Uh, Georgia is falling apart. You've got the Jack Smith case, uh, both in Florida, uh, the classified documents case and the January 6th case that could be delayed and delayed and delayed. So you may not have any sort of conviction before November, and that's bad news for Democrats. All right, State of the Union coming up this week. What does the president need to do to convince voters he is up to the job? I imagine a lot of his staff is sweating it out a little bit this week. What do you think? Well, the, the, here's the problem. You say, what can he do? Here's the problem with the State of the Union. It's what he says, but not what he's actually doing. And what he is doing, Americans aren't agreeing with it. So he can say whatever he wants, but the truth of the matter is, whether it be on the border, whether it be on the economy, and just go down the list, voters aren't buying what Joe Biden is selling. And I think that's the big part of it. But in answer to your question, look, I think that the only logical play here for Biden is to spend quite a bit of the address on the abortion issue. Now, he won't do that. He'll, he'll, he'll spend some time on it, but he's not going to spend most of his time on the abortion issue, obviously. But that is the one issue that Democrats have a leg up on politically in 2024, and they're banking a lot of their strategy on hoping they can get suburban women, especially uh, overall, in their camp uh, and, and somehow uh, stop the bleeding. But, Andrew, I know we had a wrap, but let me just be clear. The bleeding is everywhere. Uh, Donald Trump, ready for this? Donald Trump beating Donald, excuse me, Donald Trump beating Joe Biden with Hispanic voters, 46 to 40 percent. He had 8 percent support from African Americans in 2020. That's up to 23 percent in the latest poll. Joe Biden is hemorrhaging everywhere. Not a good sign for him or the Democrats. All right, David, appreciate you joining us every time. Really appreciate you with us and look forward to your reports coming up. As the abortion battle rages in post-Roe America, some viewpoints are changing on the issue. One former abortion advocate is sharing her story of how love and compassion helped her see the light. As Charlene Aaron explains, kindness won her over. Alina Clough is a writer at Evie Magazine, which focuses on the needs of women. For years, she spoke out about a woman's right to an abortion. But that all changed after a painstaking conversation that changed her views on the issue. I think I just thought for years that it was the compassionate thing to do. I had bought into a lot of lies, specifically in college. I never really centered the unborn in the conversation. As a conservative commentator and Christian, Alina Clough's views on abortion didn't match those of her friends in the pro-life community. A recent conversation helped open her eyes that abortion was wrong. It was really just her sitting there, breaking down one by one all of the misinformation that I had learned and thinking that most women just happily want abortions and realizing that a lot of women are pressured into it. I certainly realized by the end of that conversation that that wasn't something that I could stand with, that the unborn truly was life and that it was worth treating that way. While abortion advocates often paint pro-lifers as angry or lacking compassion, Clough pushed back in an op-ed for the Washington Examiner called Kindness Won Me Over to the Pro-Life Movement. A lot of the conversation around pro-lifers gets focused on the negative, whereas what I view them as, and certainly the reason that they won me over, uh, despite all of the misinformation I'd bought into, was truly their warmth and their kindness. Kindness she saw displayed during her first time at the annual March for Life. It was so powerful. They're advocating for the end to things like uh, abortion, of course, but they, they really are, are celebrating how much they love and value life. It feels different to be in a crowd like that where people are singing hymns and they're just truly celebrating um, and recognizing how much work there still is to do. Clough also admits the sad reality that abortion is being promoted as empowerment for women. I really wish that we would just stop seeing babies as such an obstacle and recognize that there's a better way out. Um, I, I don't think that we have to pit birth and life against all of these other priorities. And I think it's really sad that that's where the politics have ended up. A political idea she regrets once sharing. I'm grateful that God is a forgiving God. I am very grateful that other believers have held my hand and been very patient with me. But it does hurt to know that uh, a lot of the things that I said before defended abortion uh, in the name of God and that I gave other people perhaps justifications for continuing those beliefs. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Well, while much of the fight for the unborn takes place in the courtroom, 
there's a great reminder that loving people in the name of Jesus and showing grace and compassion can change hearts and minds maybe more effectively. Terry? Yeah. At first, Laura Danley dabbled in the occult for attention. People flocked to her to have their palms read. Soon, Laura was communicating with spirits through a Ouija board, and before long, she became a full-fledged Wiccan. I really believe I opened a lot of spiritual doorways, and that's when a lot of the torment began. I start seeing things. There were whispers all around me, all the time. It was all downhill from there. Laura Danley grew up with Christian parents, going to church and praying to Jesus. But the love she had for God turned into resentment after she was diagnosed with a life-threatening heart condition at 15. They said that my aortic root was double the size it was supposed to be. All I heard was, your life just got a lot shorter and you can never run again. I was running track and cross country before that happened. I felt betrayed by God because I thought, I've been a good kid. And I remember silently yelling, I don't want you part of my life anymore. I will get through this on my own. She began ditching classes and continued to run in secret. Then one evening after rehearsing for a school play, Laura was assaulted by a group of boys. She broke free and escaped, but the experience left her traumatized and filled with shame. Laura started looking for anything that would give her a sense of control over her life. So she bought a book on how to read palms. People would just come to me. They would flock to me. It was forbidden and I wanted power and I wanted to try everything. And so at first it seemed innocent enough. At 17, she went to a cardiologist who told her she had been misdiagnosed and that she was actually healthy. The good news only emboldened Laura to continue on with her journey into the occult. She then joined the Air Force at age 20 to become a pilot. One of her fellow cadets was a Wiccan, and he encouraged her to try a Ouija board. After buying one from a local toy store, she brought it back to the base, where she began speaking with the spirit, claiming to be a Civil War soldier. It wasn't long after that, mentally, I really started going downhill. I don't know, I can't think. It was about that time I started having flashbacks, the assault in high school. Emotionally, I was just not stable anymore. I knew that I should not be flying. I ended up getting out. It was devastating. It really was. Um, I worked really hard for my wings. Laura put away the Ouija board, though still went on to adopt the Wiccan religion. After moving to Roswell, New Mexico to attend aviation maintenance school, she met another Wiccan at a party who taught her how to read tarot cards. The power of divination was enthralling for Laura. However, it came with a price. I remember trying to get to know my tarot deck one night. I was supposed to sleep with it underneath my pillow. I woke up slammed like some, like I had been under attack. I was covered in these, these scratches, even on places on my back that I couldn't reach. It got so bad I was afraid of the dark. I think uh, I had given demonic entities an opportunity to mess with me, and that's what they were doing. This went on for the next three years. Eventually, Laura married and had a daughter, Haley. Although she loved her daughter, paranoia and depression was consuming Laura's life, and she felt her family would be better off without her. So, she planned to disappear after taking Haley to her next health checkup. But at the pediatrician's office, a nurse came over and put her hand on Laura. What she did next changed everything. She said, I want to pray for you. And I was so desperate at that point, I said, fine, whatever. She stayed in that office, I believe, for an hour and a half praying over me. And I thought, I don't know what's going on, but okay. All I know is when I left that doctor's office, I was walking across the parking lot and I had my daughter Haley in her infant carrier and I was carrying her. I looked down at her and I said, you know what? I may not be the best mother, but I'm your mother and I'm not going anywhere. I looked at the sky and I said, if you're out there, show me. I need to know. And when I got home, I saw all those stacks of books and the tarot cards and the candles and everything, and I realized this is all, this is nuts. I just, I didn't want it around me anymore. She then went to her mother-in-law, a Christian, for guidance. She took Laura to church, where a pastor answered the questions about God and the spiritual realm she had. Returning to her vehicle, Laura paused. I just bowed over and 
just started praying and crying and telling God, I have been so wrong. I tried to do all of this by myself for so long. I thought I was so strong. And I prayed and asked Jesus to take control of my life. I felt clean. I felt there was like some serious change happened all of a sudden. And looking back, I realize now that all those doors that I had opened to the spiritual realm, I believe in that moment, God was like, okay, let's close those now. The same passion Laura once had for learning about the occult, she then put toward reading the Bible, praying, and going to church. She also went to counseling, working through the traumas of her youth. It's been 18 years since Laura gave her life to Christ, and the nightmares that haunted her stopped. How grateful am I for what he's done? Words cannot define it. Not only did he rescue my daughter from a completely different life, he rescued my marriage. We have another child now. Who, my home is so free of like that spiritual oppression. I wanna talk to people about this just so that they know that if they're, they've seen things in the occult or they've been exposed to it and they're frightened and they don't know who to talk to, I wanna tell them that there is hope. We just, we've got to give it to Jesus and let him, let him heal us. There is always hope. It is God's good pleasure to heal you. It's God's good pleasure to invade your heart with his love, with his forgiveness, with his intentional purpose for your life. You know, sometimes, especially when you are young, we think we're so big and bad and we want to do it on our own. And you've sometimes that goes on for a long time in life, even when we're older, out of stubbornness. You know, we're just not giving in. I can do this. I can make this happen. You know, Laura shared something that is just as real as my hand is before me right now. She said, I think I opened the door to spiritual, to demonic entities, not spiritual, but demonic entities. I want to say to you that those demonic entities are swirling around us all the time. God loves you with an everlasting love, a love so great that he sent his only son to die for your sins. What do you think would most wound the heart of God? It would be for the enemy of God. There is an enemy of God and all his minions to turn your heart away from him, to make you bitter, to make you feel like you can't trust God, to make you feel like you're suffering or you're going through something and God doesn't know, he doesn't see you, he doesn't care. So today, I want to say to you, the Bible says this, there is only one name under heaven by which men may be saved. Oh, there are other voices, there are other powers, there are other minions, dominions, but only one person has dominion over all that happens in this world, and that is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, it's as simple as asking him into your heart, just like Laura could simply open the doors to these demonic entities. You can ask Jesus to come into your life and forgive the things that need forgiving in your life. You know, it's almost like she didn't see them until she came to the end of herself. I want to say it's kind of like that for all of us, you know. We have dreams of our own. We have journeys of our own. We've been wounded by different things. When we come to the end of being the answer, the solution, the, so the problem solving of it all, and cry out to Jesus, suddenly he opens our eyes and we begin to see all the things that, that we do, that we say that we are involved in that created our own issues. And yet, in the middle of all of that, even as we stagger around and even as we moan and groan and weep and try to figure out what life is all about, the creator of the universe waits. He waits for you and for me. Isn't that a remarkable thought? Today, Jesus is waiting for you and I ask you, have you had enough of yourself? Have you had enough of the world trying to tell you what's important, what you should or shouldn't do, what makes you special or unique? We're all unique and special to the one who created us, but we'll never know why we were created or what the purpose was until we come to him and surrender. That's why we talk about surrendering to the Lord. It's saying, 
I can't do it. I can't be it. I don't have it all together. I'm giving it to you, God. And I'm asking you to make something that matters out of my life. I'm asking you to forgive me for my sins. I'm asking you to love me in spite of who I am and what I've done. I'm asking you to give me the gift of life with you, not just here, but forever and ever without end. You get to have that. That's God's offer to each and every one of us. Will you take it today? You know, prayer is just communicating with God. It's just talking to him like I'm talking to you. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be profound. It has to be honest. Let go and let God take control of your life. If you have dabbled in the occult, I want to offer something to you. Angels, Demons, and the End Times. This is a free uh, resource for you. It's available with your phone call to our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000. Just ask for this resource on today's show, Angels, Demons, and the End Times. We'll send it to you right away. If you've prayed that prayer and given your life to Jesus Christ, ask for this also. A new day. It's a packet put together for you. What do you do now that you've prayed the prayer? How do you grow in this new life with Jesus Christ? All of this is yours, free for the asking. The phone call is free too. 1 800 700 7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. It's being called the most brutal blizzard of the season. The snowstorm that swept through the Sierra Nevadas dumped more than 12 feet of snow on California and packed wind gusts up to 190 miles an hour. More than 300 vehicles got stuck on Interstate 80. Parts of the highway were shut down for days and officers went car to car to check on stranded people. Sugar Bowl Resort near Lake Tahoe posted this image of snow piled up to the second story windows of a building. While this storm has passed, another one is on the way tonight. Wow. Well, CBN recently sponsored the dubbing of the popular TV series, The Chosen in Urdu, Pakistan's national language. Many people, including translators, voice actors, video editors, and producers were involved in the project. It culminated with The Chosen making its Pakistan broadcast debut in late January. CBN will continue participating in opportunities like this to share the gospel with many more people of different languages around the world. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. The roof was torn from the walls and water flooded the house. Raquel's home had just been hit by a Category 5 hurricane, and her terrified children thought it was the end of the world. For years, Raquel ran a food business to help her husband provide for their three children. I have been selling corn, esquites, and fried plantains for about 10 years now. Everyone here knows me. Then in the middle of the night, a Category 5 hurricane struck the city where they live in Mexico. According to seven-year-old Edwin, they were all terrified. I heard the roof fly away, and that scared me. There was water all around us. They were crying when all this happened. They said, Mom, is this the end of the world? I said, no, we are going to make it through this. Everything for my business was gone. The oven where I cook, my pot, the water took everything. Today, a hand truck that survived has a new purpose. When I heard different people were giving food away, I ran to get some. That's where she met the team from Operation Blessing. You gave Raquel food and clean water for her family. She invited us to see what was left of their house and business. Right now, I have no business. We have nothing, but I will keep fighting for my children. That's when you helped again. You provided Raquel everything needed, a new pot, utensils, and raw materials to get her business up and running again. Tomorrow, I'm going to start selling corn, God willing. I will get up early, boil the corn, and prepare the food to sell, because my former clients were already asking, when are you going to sell again? I thank you for what you have done. Thank you for helping us. Now mom is able to work again. 
you know, we here at CBN live in Hurricane Alley, and so we've experienced what it's like not to have a Category 5 hit us, but to feel just the rim of things like that. Can you imagine in a small makeshift home with children there and, and no means of really protecting yourself, experiencing something like that, and then everything's lost? How do you pick up and start over again? Well, 700 Club members, you made that possible for this little family, and this is just one family that you've helped. We want to say thank you. They're moving forward. Their hope is restored. She has an opportunity now to support her children and to make life good, to start that business over again. We want to say thank you. To the rest of you, join with us. You have the privilege, really, of touching people in need around the world with your gift giving. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. So won't you join with us? We have lots of club levels you can look at for joining. Take a look at the list. That top line is a general membership, but you could go up to 700 Club Gold. That's $40 a month. Our 1,000 Club members join us at $84 a month. And then there's a 2,500 Club level. That's $209 a month. Or our founders at $417 a month. That works out to $5,000 a year. Ask God what he'd have you do. And then know that when we link arms together, we become a mighty army of sharing his love and his provision with others. And by the way, when you join, our way of saying thank you is to send you gorgeous Gordon's latest, How to Believe for Healing. Who doesn't want to understand more of what the Word of God has to say about that? And it's accompanied by a handbook for Christians, a devotional of sorts, a journal to help you work through the principles that are a part of this teaching from Gordon. We want you to have it all. Our number's toll free. If you'd love to join with us, call 1-800-700-7000. All you have to say is, I'd like to join the 700 Club. When you do, we send these out to you right away. Andrew? The predator who seized Mitzi Sanchez had already murdered 10 children, and Mitzi was supposed to be number 11. Her torture in the hands of her kidnapper lasted three days. The haunting memories and pain continued for years. I felt like the worst has already happened to me. I was so angry at the world. It was eight-year-old Mitzi Sanchez's birthday. She was hurrying home from school to attend her party when a stranger asked her for help. He asked me to pick up a piece of duct tape that was on the floorboard of his car because he said he broke his hip in a bike accident and that he couldn't bend over. My parents always taught me to be kind, to be generous, to be helpful. When Midzi reached for it, the stranger forced her into his car. I tried to open the door and it was like it was jammed. And he told me that if I tried to get away that he was gonna shoot me. And I believed him. Mitzi's kidnapper chained her to the car and drove away. For the next two days, he kept her there, forced her to drink alcohol, and sexually abused her. It like crushed my little heart because I realized that nobody was coming to save me. I remember feeling so dirty and just tired. On day three, Mitzi recalled a conversation she'd had with her uncle weeks before. He said, if you don't ask for forgiveness, you're going to go to hell. I knew that I was going to die. That caused me to pray. I said, Lord, forgive me for bugging my big sister and let my family know that I love them. Soon after, her kidnapper left her alone in the car with his keys. Mitzi escaped and flagged down a truck driver who called the police. They returned Mitzi to her family and arrested her kidnapper who confessed to killing 10 other girls. He was convicted and later died in prison. Even though Midsy was safe, her innocence was gone forever. I just wanted to hide. I didn't want to talk about what happened to me because I felt like nobody knew or understood. I felt like I was the only one in the world. I could no longer look at myself as a kid because I was introduced to these adult things and it really broke my spirit. I was always sad, depressed, worried. By middle school, Mitzi's depression turned inward. She began drinking and using drugs regularly to numb the pain. By 14, she was a full-blown alcoholic. I never wanted to let anybody get close enough to me to hurt me again. For many years, my life revolved around alcohol, cocaine, ecstasy, 
gang fights, being arrested, and just hating the world because I really believed that there was no good in this world. I had so much rage and anger inside of me that I didn't even need a reason to fight. I just fought. Then at 16, Missy heard about another missing eight-year-old girl. She felt compelled to help, so she sobered up long enough to get involved, organizing searches and even sharing her own story to raise awareness. When the girl's body was found a few days later, the tragedy only added to Mitzi's pain. I didn't understand why I got to come home and why she didn't. And that's when I started to feel guilty. Mitzi went right back to her destructive lifestyle. Even the birth of her daughter the following year didn't change her heart. That hate that I was holding on to was causing me to stay drunk because I still had this ugliness in my heart that I wasn't willing to let go. Then, her best friend's mom invited her to church. I didn't know what to expect, but I was drawn to go. I felt led to go up to the altar because I wanted to give my life to God. And I felt the presence of God overwhelm me. And in that moment, I knew that God's power was real. Midzi dedicated her life to Christ. However, something was still missing. I was so angry and just full of stress and torment. I was doing things that I didn't want to do. I just couldn't stop doing them. Midzi spent time reading her Bible and was discipled by her pastors, who stressed the importance of forgiveness. And when they taught me that my healing depended on how well I forgive and ask for forgiveness, it changed my life because I was holding on to so much bitterness and unforgiveness for the people that hurt me. My whole life, I was told by multiple people that I did not have to forgive the man that kidnapped and raped me. Soon after, Mitzi met with her pastors over a Zoom call for a time of deliverance and prayer. They called things out of me by name. And when they called out the anger, the abuse, the trauma, I felt a demon come out of my body. I felt the fire of God. And it was like a refreshing fire that started at my feet and came up my body. I've repented and asked God to forgive me for all of the wicked things that I did out of my anger and bitterness. I forgave the man that kidnapped me. And when I said his name out loud and I said, I forgive Curtis Dean Anderson, that bitterness and unforgiveness left me. I was literally standing taller and I had instant joy and peace and all of a sudden just didn't want to drink anymore. It shifted my life. I've never been the same. Mitzi says now she is free to confidently fulfill God's purpose in her life. She started a nonprofit, the Mitzi Sanchez Foundation, to help missing and exploited children. My identity before was the kidnapped girl. My identity now is in Christ. It was only through Jesus Christ that I was able to get all of that ugliness removed out of my body and my mind and my heart. I gave God all of my anger and, and He gave me peace. He gave me freedom. Isn't it infuriating and heartbreaking to consider an eight-year-old girl heading home to celebrate her own birthday party and it's put through hell for two days like that? Who can blame her for coping through alcohol and drugs and taking on the identity of that kidnapped girl? But no longer. She was set free by the power of God and by forgiving and by being released of the oppression she was under emotionally and spiritually. We can learn so much from Mitzi. You know, it's the writer of Hebrews in the 12th chapter who said, let us throw off everything that so easily entangles us. And where do we put those things? We put them at the cross of Christ. We put them at the cross of Christ. You know, forgiveness is hard. I don't have to tell you that. Forgiving is hard. Nobody, I shouldn't say nobody. Most folks don't want to forgive. We want to hold that pain and bitterness and punish that person. But forgiveness isn't just so we can be nice to people. Because it's because God knows we're set free. We're set free emotionally. 
and spiritually. This is a kingdom principle that forgiveness will lead to freedom. The pain and hurt will still be there many times, but that, uh, that burden of bitterness we're released from. And Mitzi also said, you know, the pastors were calling out things that she was holding on to. I just want to pray for you for a moment for a spirit of forgiveness and to release you from things. You may love Jesus, but you're still holding on to pain and trauma, and that can be understandable. But let's follow Mitzi's example of taking the bold, courageous step to forgive and release what we're carrying. Would you pray with me now? Father God, you know the trauma I have been through. You know what I've endured, and you know who has hurt me and what they have done. And right now, I say that person's name. Say that person's name right now. Just speak their name and the offense against you. And Lord God, please receive this information. I'm praying to you now. And Lord God, I pray for these folks to be released now, those who have been molested, abused, raped, treated harshly, abandoned by parents or a spouse. Lord God, we put all this pain and trauma for the cross. And I pray, Lord God, for those who find it so difficult to forgive that your Holy Spirit will do a mighty work in their life. And like the writer of Hebrews says, we will release these things that entangle us and run the race for you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may need further prayer, and we're here for you. one 800 700-7000, whatever your prayer request is, someone is there to pray with you. Well, we love to hear from you, and we enjoy getting your email questions, so we're going to take some time to answer them. Uh, Andrew, this is Beverly, who wrote in and said, when I'm in church, I'm always overwhelmed with emotion causing me to cry. Help me understand why this happens. Isn't that interesting, Terry, how that can <laughs> When I saw this question, I wrote down C.S. Lewis's quote. He said, man does not have a soul. He is a soul. He has a body. And, you know, Galatians says the spirit of Jesus is put into our hearts. The Holy Spirit, if you're a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit is living in you. And you're, you know, in symmetry with that spirit. I remember, Terry, I wasn't at church. Um, you know, when I'm at church crying, I'll kind of do the little wipes so no one sees it. But it does happen. But I was at home on the porch reading the Word of God, and I was in Romans, and all of a sudden I just started weeping. And you know, this is Paul's discourse about how all of us fall short of the glory of God, and I'm thinking, why am I weeping reading this? It's because the Word of God is alive and active. Yeah. You know? And the Spirit of God comes into us in those places and just, um, you know, just reminds us of the greatness of God's plan and His purpose and the tremendousness of His forgiveness yes. and love. I mean, it is overwhelming if you really do what you're talking about. You're in a quiet place and you're actually letting God speak to your heart and mind. I think it can be and like that. And we're designed to worship. Yes, yes. You know, that's one of the main reasons we're here is to worship. And the Holy Spirit will come upon us sometimes and, and come alive when we least expect it. You know, sometimes it can be a bringing sadness, right? Yeah. Yes. I, I love when people say, I felt, and uh, in one of our stories today, she said, I felt led to go to the altar. You know, that's the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God leading to a place, you to a place of God touching those deepest parts of your life and really ministering healing and wholeness to you. I love that. And when, when we feel that way, when yes. we feel the Holy Spirit kind of working in our heart, I think it's best just to go with it. Yeah, just try not to so. fight it. It can be a little scary sometimes. It's like, why am I? Why is this being stirred up in me? Let the Holy Spirit move in Don't your heart. Don't worry about what other people think or who's looking at you. Just that's a big go one. With yeah, God. I just said, you know, yeah. I'm in church, kind of. You know, yeah. No one's going to see me crying here. <laughs> but you're right, and it'll help other people grow as well. Yes, amen, yeah. amen. Yeah. Well, here is a word from Colossians: Forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's so important for us to remember all that God has forgiven us for. And we love you. Thanks for joining us on the 700 Club. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.